All right, Drew Walgren, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So to the location stamp, as we do often on our show for the audience, I am in Chicago, where I usually record. Whereabouts are you dialing in from? I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area on the East Bay side. Nice, nice. I have never been, so I don't know the nuance of that, but I'm sure it's nice out there. <laughs> it's, it's not, hey, it's good weather. You know, you can't complain about weather in California. You know, just uh, that's what you pay for out here. So isn't everybody, Drew, in the Bay Area pretty much working for tech, but you're not, or maybe you did before? How did you end up in real estate and in the Bay Area? Yeah, it, it feels like everyone's in tech out here, and, and it feels like everyone makes, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars doing anything for tech <laughs> these days. It's it's bizarre. You know, I always used to say that people, uh, people who um, park bicycles at the Google campus probably make more money than most people. Uh, that's that's kind of uh, the world that's out there in Silicon Valley. But yeah, I found myself in real estate after um, I bought uh, my first piece of real estate in the in the very bottom of the market uh, back around 2011, and and really got a great deal and, and fixed up a property and and uh, lived in it for um, five years too. So it wasn't just an investment property, but um, I knew that I had a you know good timing and I fixed it up and I sold it and made. Um, you know, a great profit on it. And I decided at that point, which direction I wanted to go as far as real estate investing. Do I want to keep this property? Do I want to sell it and put it into um, something else and flip it, do some DIY flipping myself? Or do I want to go to the passive route? And I had a W2 job that I was getting a lot of opportunities from. I enjoyed. Um, and so I said, you know what? I, I think my time is better spent here. And I went the passive route. So um, never looked back. I think there's a lot of great ways to make money in real estate, but for me, that was a great fit. And um, after some time, I looked around at my W two job and said, "Wow, I've seen a lot of opportunities." And all of a sudden, things start to plateau as you come up through a sort of large corporation, right? You look around and go, "Oh, I'm waiting for someone to retire or die." <laughs> so wow. I said, "Okay, um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna make this jump." And um, my brother, who had also worked uh, in the commercial real estate world. Uh, for some time already, he said, hey, let's, uh, you know, you're tired of where you're at. I'm tired of where I'm at. Let's go. Um, you know, we'll start raising capital and partner with some of these sponsors that him and I had both invested with already passively. So started to do that and quickly realized, hey, you know what? The guys over at Mad Capital Partners, we love the strategy, love the team. And we essentially merged in and sort of um, kind of just all, all joined together in forces. So just under one umbrella of Mad Capital Partners, we've been uh, rock and rolling for myself the last couple of years, but um, as a firm, been around since uh, beginning of 2015. So it's been a good ride, and and really have kept our focus where uh, since 2015. Nice. Let's talk about the first passive investment. So I have heard a handful of people come on the show with stories kind of like yours. Most of the audience is probably used to guests who come on and we're swinging hammers, we're flipping a house, we're changing a toilet, we're buying a rental property. Uh, we're repeating that a hundred times and then a hundred times per year. <laughs> um, and then we have a, a handful of people like yourself who had really good careers. And like, I, I always share this story, Drew, when I got started, you know, the story about burning the boats and the Vikings and all that. So you have no escape, right? I just yeah. didn't because I like pre burned it all from like the way I was living before. So there was like no other option for me, right? It was like, you know, came from selling cars, got in trouble because I crashed a car that I did not own and like had to <laughs> do time for that. So like no one was going to yeah. give this kid keys to cars at the dealership ever again, right? Yeah, um, so I yeah, my back was up against a wall. And I remember in the first, let's say, I don't know, six to eight, six to nine months before, I think it was like five or six months till I did the first deal. But I remember thinking like, you know, looking back, if I had a job being an architect and I was making 70, 80, $90,000 a year back in 2006, uh, I, I don't know that I would have stuck with it. And so I feel like a lot of people who get started, like if there's no other option, we have to make it work because that's life. But if you're in a position where you have something that pays the bills or maybe even more than pays the bills and you're really getting a lot of satisfaction out of it, like it sounds like you were at the time, uh, the yeah. challenge going forward and figuring out what direction we want to go. I mean, I guess you have more options maybe than I had at that time when you come into the business, but I'm curious if you could elaborate and dive into the decision of uh, active investing versus passive, and then talk about the first passive deal that you actually chose and how you found it. 
Sure. Um, that decision really was, um, I'm a DIY guy, right? So at my own home that I live in currently, something goes wrong, unless it's outside of my capabilities. And, and I'm, you know, I'll, I don't want to toot my horn here, but I'll say I'm a fairly capable person. When I was uh, 19 through 21 or so, I worked as a mechanic at my family's auto shop, right? So comfortable with tools, comfortable with doing things like that. So happy to do it. And I was honestly just at a great stage in my life where I'm starting to understand myself more and more. And I realized, I like, go, oh, if I if I own and manage a property, I'm going to be hands on too hands-on, more hands-on than the tenant would like to be, uh, more more hands-on than I would like to be, but it's something that I know I won't be able to help myself with. I'll be going, okay, what's going on? I'm going to go check it out. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to be in and out of there. And I thought, oh, this is not the life I want to build for myself. So some of it's a personality decision, right? And I think a lot of other people are really good about managing that um, and separating themselves and saying, hey, you know what, I got a handyman, I'm going to stay out of it, whatever, you know, they separate themselves, and, and they have very little connection with their tenants, and, you know, good for them, right, I, I don't think, and I didn't think at that time that I really would be, uh, that would be a great fit for me, so that was part of the decision, um, I had, uh, at that point, had one kid, I have two now, and I thought, well, you know, so in the evenings, I'm going to be over there, here and there and you know hopefully you scale that too right that's the goal is not just to own one and you scale that and continue to uh, leverage and acquire more property so I'm going to be busy with these things in the evenings after my day job and now I'm not going to spend time with my kids and before you know it they're going to turn you know eight nine ten then twenty pages of the calendar come off and you realize you're busy uh, dealing with stupid fix it issues right so that was part of it for me I, I thought uh, I don't want to do that and that's um, again a little personality a little bit of a lifestyle thing for me personally and that's not the same decision everyone should make right um, other people are have that um, time and and um, and can separate themselves in a way or have a great property manager that can handle a lot of that for them um, you know, everyone's in a different place. So that was for me, my decision. And then really the first um, passive investors, commercial real estate syndication, as people call them. Uh, as I mentioned, my older brother was working for a commercial real estate sponsor team. And really they were essentially a capital raising team and they would partner with um, with a, an operator, right? That you see this a lot in this world um, where folks will raise capital on one side and they'll partner with another group who actually you know, acquires a property, they manage it, they, you know, they stabilize it, they sell it, all the sort of on the ground operations. So he had been working on a couple of deals and showed me in and, you know, we would talk about commercial real estate investments over beers all the time. And so at the time I, I sold this property and I'm like, okay. And we had been talking about it for a while. He goes, all right, we got this property. It's in uh, Northwest Houston. It's a large multi-tenanted industrial uh, piece of real estate. And it's funny, and um, you know, in hindsight, really, that's actually the worst investment I made, <laughs> really, now, in the commercial real estate space, passively, right? And I think I would have recognized some of those things uh, standing back now. So I still give my brother a hard time. Why, that. Go, why was that the worst? What specifically made that? Well, one as far as the returns, yeah, objectively, from a you know, from a numbers and returns and cash flow standpoint so far, and it's still active, right? Uh, it, I am still seeing cash flow, but it's minimal. I think I'm averaging about two and a half percent cash flow over the last uh, three and a half, four years or so. Um, so that one, it's, you know, it's lower on the returns. And, you know, in hindsight, looking back at it, I go, oh, wow, you know, it's so interesting now after investing in, um, you know, seven or eight different syndications now, and you see, and looking at, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of other offerings out there, um, you saw, I look back at that one and go, yeah, I, I wouldn't have bid on that one today. Um, but back then I said, I was anxious to get in the game. I was anxious to deploy some capital, see those uh, cash distributions. And it was just a behemoth of a project, um, very, very large. And with a lot of uh, small businesses that really, um, you know, when you have a multi-tenanted industrial property like that, who are your tenants, right? There are a lot of um, small fabrication shops, small um, auto alignment shops, uh, things like that. And these, a lot of these uh, companies, these businesses kind of come and go, um, you know, with the uh, come and go with locations um, and come and go in and out of business, right? People set up a shop, they hey, I'm going to make um you know, hand-blown glass uh, art or something like that. And, you know, sure enough, it 
goes belly up in a few years, right? I mean, really, these are the kind of businesses who tenant these properties. So um, there was a lot of that, and there was just uh, so many, so much more, so much more complicated about this that I think, uh, in hindsight, and looking at deals now, I always try to find something that's a little bit uh, simpler. Frankly, I just look at it and go, I want to find something that really makes sense. It's not too many moving parts um, because. Frankly, there's just more things to go wrong. And I'll make a reference back to when I used to be a mechanic at an auto shop, right? The more bells and whistles the car uh, had, the more things to go wrong, right? That was sort of uh, how, I guess, the analogy here with a property. And if you have something that's got a lot of different things to manage, there's just more risk that you're taking on. And so that's something to take um, into account. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we do, uh, because it really is kind of a polar opposite of that. Yeah, before we get into to MAG, and we're going to focus on that here in a moment, but the multi-tenanted industrial property, the first deal, we'll stay on that for just a moment, has these transient businesses, meaning they're coming, they're going, they're they're small, so we don't have this like 5, 10, 15 year, you know, cash flow period where they're staying there and there's no vacancy. Right. I imagine a lot of these filling, are three to five year leases, you know, um, and then we're filling short. those that are probably taking longer than an apartment to find just the right fabricator or get glass blower to use your example there. What other risks would you have recognized on the front end in the prospectus of that deal? Uh, then knowing everything you know now, is there anything else besides the transient nature of the tenant population there that would have been a red flag for you? Uh, I think now, if I looked at it again, I mean, I love the location. Um, I think still Houston's a great market to be in. Um, and I'm still very bullish on Texas and Houston. I mean, they're rapidly growing. Um, so I love the market there. But I think uh, one piece of the offering was, you know, some of the value add, right? Hey, there's this is the, um, you know, for a lot of folks, hey, I'm going to add value here. What's wrong here that I can fix up? And um there seemed to be a little bit of a trend of tenants who were um, delinquent, right? And so there was some writing off some bad debts and really wasn't just sort of writing off some bad debts and collecting on what you could. It was, um, I think, more of a trend there. I'm not sure how I would have identified that ahead of time, but it seemed to be that, hey, okay, we collected what we could, we wrote off some bad debts and evicted some tenants, but now there seems to be some more of that happening. So it was kind of interesting. I don't know how I really could have predicted that, to be honest. You're like, how do you know the next tenant is going to start going delinquent? That's yeah. uh, next door to one who already has been delinquent. So um, yeah, it's it might have been you know a sub-market issue, really. I, to be honest, I haven't gone back and really dissected that piece of it. Um, but it's something that seemed to sort of um, uh, continue to be existed even after the first year or so of kind of eliminating a lot of those bad debts and collecting what you could. Um, so I'm not sure if it, yeah, again, if that's a sub market there where that's just more commonplace or uh, I'm not sure uh, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, it's the industrial flex property that I've ever invested in personally. Um, and, you know, left a little bad taste in my mouth. It doesn't mean that's a bad asset class. And, you know, I, we're mad capital partners as an industrial, but certainly a different um, type of industrial property. You know, this is a very, large, again, multi-tenanted property with a lot of very small businesses who um, you don't have a lot of background on, right? And it's uh, very similar for multifamily too. And this is why I like what we do with MAG. We have these single tenant properties. I'll get to that again. But, you know, with a uh, multifamily property, for instance, you know, you lose a tenant. And like you said, um, you can retenant those properties somewhat quickly. If you're, you know, if you have a nice property or something at least that, you um, uh, has a good value for the rent that you're asking for, uh, you're going to be able to retenant that property in like 30 to 60 days. Usually a lot of folks I see them, they're like, they're retenant the property in a week, right? They have someone at least signing the lease and move in date is set. Um, with these, like you said, it might take a little longer. It might take, uh, you know, two, three months. It might take longer than that, right? So, but you still have that lack of credit and background of these businesses. You know, we all have a really light, touch on on credit. I mean, with multifamily tenants, you don't know much, you can do a credit check, that really doesn't tell you much. Um, but that's okay, you have a multi tenanted property. So that's a trade off. Um, and again, we'll get into what we do. Um, but with single tenant properties, where you have a lot more due diligence and credit, um, uh, a lot more 
there to sink your teeth into uh, the credit of the tenant, you have a lot more of an understanding of who that is, um, even though it's a concentrated ten tenancy, which is 100% tenant in a single tenant property. So I hope that makes sense. And, and we'll jump into that later. Gotcha. Getting ahead of myself. Yeah. It, it sounds like it's as simple as evaluating the deal based on the risk of the tenants. And obviously there's more or less of that available depending on the asset class and depending on who the tenant is. So I, I think it's I think it's solid. And we all, I think we all who are progressing in our real estate career learn to get a little bit more instinctual about our gauging of those tenants as time goes on, you know, from the single family section eight or otherwise uh landlord who gets a gut feel or checks the car for trash as an example when the tenant comes for the showing and is making their decision on these other alternative pieces of information uh, i'm i'm sure you're going to get into some of that nuance about selecting industrial tenants who are actually capable of paying the bills and are going to continue to do so over a period of time and why that might be exciting to people investing passively in a deal so what's your role at mag capital drew I'm a capital markets director of capital markets officially. So I'm working on the debt side and equity, uh, lining up, you know, lending from banks as well as uh, bringing in and raising capital from our investors uh, to raise the equity for acquisitions. Perfect. What are the primary deal types that MAG Capital is and has done so far? Uh, I'd say that our first love and probably about 80% of what we do are single tenant. Uh, net lease industrial real estate. Um, and kind of to get more specific on that, it's usually we're making uh, acquisitions to be a, a sale lease back transaction. So we're purchasing a property from a commercial business who operates and owns the property. Um, and they're uh, essentially selling the property and leasing it back simultaneously. So it's a, it's, it's for them, it's a financing transaction. Uh, they're looking to access the capital that they're sitting on. Uh, so that's a, the main thing we do. And um, I'd say outside of that, we do some uh, blend and extend deals as people call them, or we'll um, get into contract on a property and uh, work to with the tenant to blend their lease rates and kind of smooth it out and get an extension on that lease. That's something we like to do. Um, and then outside of that, in the last year, we've made a, a push over into the private equity space. And I'll kind of explain the reasoning for that. But um, we have a lot of similar core competencies as a private equity group does because we work so closely with a single tenant property um, that we've begun to understand how to evaluate business really well. So um, we've made some acquisitions now in the private equity space where we're buying not only the real estate, but the operating company as well. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, you know, we have a credit team here on our staff and we evaluate uh, the credit of these businesses uh, from a real estate perspective, right? So we've done this for years since 2015. We have, uh, you know, that skill set. And I always used to say, hey, we kind of waddle and quack like a private equity group. You know, we focus so much on that because that's where the risk is when you have a single tenant property with a long term lease and a, and a triple net lease. You know, where is the risk? It's all in the solvency of this tenant. So for us, we've had, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of repetition, a lot of experience looking at tenants and understanding the risk around them and what they look like. And we've been rubbing shoulders with private equity groups the whole time. As private equity groups purchase an operating company, oftentimes that acquisition comes with the real estate. So we'll partner with them and they say, okay, I bought Joe's Manufacturing here for $20 million, but you know what? 10 million of that is tied up in the real estate. That's not what I wanna do as a private equity group. I want to spin off the real estate so I can use that 10 million of capital and go buy another business, right? continue to acquire and, and find synergies in my operating company. So we've partnered with them. We've really understood how they evaluate investment opportunities, how they stack their capital and, and um, structure that as they make an acquisition. So learn for, I mean, the last couple of years, we've just been thinking and looking around going, okay, this is a natural, um, you know, um, diversification for us you know it makes perfect sense to kind of get in this world because it's so similar to what we do now and so uh we just made an acquisition of a company um, an auto transport company in texas you know this is not sexy stuff these are businesses <laughs> who are already um profitable um you know this particular company does uh, about 20 million dollars in revenue about 10 percent ebitda margins um and so they're profitable so you go all right this is a much stable 
more stable investment than a startup, right? I'm not investing into the next Uber technologies or something like that. Uh, this is not a swing for the fences. This is a company that's cash flowing now, and we see opportunity to grow that. So uh, we just closed on this uh, this uh, excuse me operating company, and you know it came with all the trucks and trailers and real estate, so you can use that depreciation just like you would in a real estate only deal. Front load that depreciation and offset gains, um, and in the meantime. This company has contractual relationships uh, that go back over 20 years with Mercedes, Volkswagen, Hyundai, um, and Kia to bring their vehicles from the ports and the railheads out to their dealerships. So really nice and stable kind of um, business with great long-term relationships. You know, and what we want to do is just diversify their customer base more, grow the business more, get more contracts you know, possibly hire more drivers and buy more trucks and grow that EBITDA by a certain amount. So, I mean, I could talk about this for a while. It's a little bit of a departure from real estate, um, but the way these businesses are valued and the way you add value is a little bit different and it's pretty interesting. And, and it's something that um, we've got a lot of experience again with, uh, but in this case, we actually JV'd with them. Um, a guy who used to be the CEO of one of our tenant companies, if you can believe it. So here's a manufacturing company. We own the asset for five, six years, really get to know the management staff, including the CEO. And so we had this relationship with him and we JV'd with him over here to place him as CEO of this operating company so he could manage it. I want to focus on real estate, not managing day-to-day -day operations of an operating company. So that's important to kind of make sure we can keep our focus on real estate and maybe new private equity um, acquisitions as well. But I can't do that if I'm tied up day-to-day -day operations with uh, the auto transport company, right? Yeah, it makes sense. I'm curious, did you guys see volumes drop off with the chip shortage and the, the vehicle shortage that we see now? Is that like a, a real yeah, risk for you guys? 100%, yeah, 2020 and 2021, little drop in their revenues. And what's great about this particular business that we acquired was, they have a really variable cost structure. So as revenues dropped, uh, so did their costs and expenses. And so their EBITDA margins remain the exact same, even though they had a 15, 20% drop in revenue. So company is really well managed and they have that structure, which really helps them. You don't have to worry about the amount of overhead um, really killing you in a, uh, in a short term temporary drop. And, you know, we obviously see an upswing coming up in the future with production uh, kinks and logistics and all that hopefully being worked out. I know right now we're like in the throes of it out there. Oh, yeah. You know, they're talking about the ports at Long Beach and the East Coast so everyone's backed up. And, you know, so hopefully we get through this. And as that happens, these guys only stand to see an upswing. Nice. Interesting. So let's circle back to the uh, the the triple net lease back sale lease back right you know in the example you threw out a 20 million dollar business and 10 million dollars in real estate immediately being peeled off i guess a, a lease is put in place and i feel like at at first blush me as a, a real estate investor is like well why didn't i just go get the you know cash out refinance from the bank it, you know if that's possible and right. it's a, a difficult one uh, and or, you know, what's the plan with the private equity, then they're just going to buy another business and sell off this business with the lease and kind of the assets stripped out of it a little bit. I guess I'm I'm looking for a little more, you know, of the story okay. of how that shakes out, right? Good questions. Absolutely. So the seller's uh, motivation, right, it can vary from deal to deal. And so I, I find this stuff interesting, each business where they're at in their journey. Um, you know, a lot of these businesses have been around for, you know, 60, 70, 100 plus years. Mm -hmm. And so and some of these have owned the real estate and operated out of since, since like, we did a deal recently and the company had been there since 1950, actually developed the proper, the buildings and everything there. And at this point, we're just looking to, hey, we're going to do this transaction and basically deleverage a little bit, uh, strengthen our balance sheet. Again, there's nothing really uh, uh, exciting sometimes about it. And at other times it can be, right? Hey, we're going to use these uh, the proceeds. We're going to invest in new equipment, new product lines. You know, we're going to see, you know, 20% growth in revenues over the next 12 months from this investment, you know, whatever it might be. It just depends on case to case. But you're right, they have other options, right? So if I'm the CFO of Joe's Manufacturing, I go, I want to access some capital because uh, maybe want to buy new equipment, whatever it might be. Uh, I could go get a loan from a bank, right? And the disadvantage there is it's going to come with some 
covenants uh, that bank is going to say, okay, you have to maintain certain financial benchmarks. You have to, you know, you really have to um, watch certain things. Just like um, if you ever seen a, a CMBS loan, for instance, or um, all kinds of loans that will have these little uh, tripwires, basically, where they can default on you and maybe possess some assets. So you want to really make sure that you have something um, uh, that's a loan that's not coming with too many of those tripwires, too many of those default scenarios where, hey, if, I, if I'm not careful, I might defaulting on my loan with this bank. And now that $10 million goes on the liability side of my balance sheet. So keep that in mind, because when you look at the other side on the real estate piece, you're right, I can get a line of credit, right? Cash out, refinance, uh, line of credit, either one, but I can't access 100% of the equity in here. If I have that $10 million property, I can access maybe $7 million with a line of credit. Um, and again, that's going to go on the liability side of my balance sheet. So maybe I already have a senior, uh, some senior debt with a bank and they say you can only have so much, um, you know, debt to EBITDA ratio. You know, there's a there's a cap here. So if I take on more debt um, through this line of credit, OK, well, now I just violated a covenant with my existing debt over here. So it's always important to kind of make sure these different debt instruments, these different capital instruments play nicely with each other. Um, so now we look at the sale lease back, right? Hey, I could just sell this property. I can set up a nice long term lease, 15, 20 years. Um, sure, it's triple net. I take on the responsibility of maintaining the property, but I've owned it for a long time. I'm used to that. I already have. Um, you know, generally, these people have taken very good care of their property because they've owned it for a while um, and they operate their whole business oftentimes out of this property. So for them, that doesn't go onto their liability side of their balance sheet. So that's really nice. They're not uh, leveraging up on their balance sheet. And um, that rent that they pay is tax deductible. So it's there's a couple other pieces there, but it's really, those are the top two things is I'm able to access, you know, all of the equity tied up in here and make tax deductible rent payments and, and protect myself from volatility and rent, um, the rent market out there, right? I'm going to have maybe two, two and a half, three percent annual increases over 20 years. Well, if rents kind of go crazy, then I feel a little bit protected. I'm not subject to that if I have to sign a new lease in five years, for instance. So, you know, if you're a company that doesn't plan on going anywhere, that's kind of a nice long-term uh, protection for you. So a triple net lease is what, Drew? Typically going to be a 15-year term, a 20-year term? Who's pushing for the longer term? We are uh, typically, you know, a tenant yeah. might want less, of course, you know, but um, it depends. Yeah, someone may say, hey, I would like to protect myself from any volatility in rent prices. Um, so I would like a long-term lease, you know, it's interesting. Everyone sort of has their own motivation and wants and needs. But yeah, triple net, at least just for any of your listeners who don't know, that means the tenant is responsible for property taxes, insurance, utilities, and really what we call uh, what we call the lease that we set up is an absolute net lease, meaning it's everything. They're also responsible for maintenance, capital expenditure items like roof and structure, paving the parking lot, mechanical, HVAC, all of that. So it's a very passive lease for the landlord. We don't have to manage a property. Um, and we keep tabs on it, of course. You still need to make sure that their the tenant's not letting it fall apart. But generally, you don't see that because you have a, someone who's operating their company. They can't make money uh, you know, manufacturing gears and sprockets or food or whatever it is while the roof's leaking, right? They need to make sure it's clean and up to date. So um, that's triple net lease is a lot more common when you get to single tenant properties. Um, you'll see this where a tenant's essentially trading off the management of the property and you know the maintenance and repairs of the property for a low overhead in in um, in the rent, right? You're you know you're a gross lease, which is the opposite of a triple net, right? A gross lease where the landlord's responsible for all that. Uh, they're going to pay more, right? You're responsible for more as a landlord. So there's a trade-off there. And for us, we would rather go the triple net lease space because it's uh, much more predictable. We have a really consistent cash flow that we can really depend on, right? We're not going to get uh, cash flow gobbled up by some expenses uh, from one quarter to the next. Yeah, and you don't have these vacancies within that 15 or 20 year period either, like uh, single family, residential, multifamily. It's the vacancies and the repairs that really kill us uh, in that space. Whereas, you know, the allure of you describing the triple net lease situation is that there's not going to be any vacancies as long as my credit team, you know, made the correct call. And then, of course, a little bit of luck in the marketplace for the business who's in that space. Uh, isn't going to hurt the situation. 
So let's run through an example deal. Maybe if you have one that's real, I'm curious, you know, what's the purchase price um, to the seller? Maybe what the rent is to the seller, how that purchase price is determined by your end. I assume there's some kind of negotiation there. And then how that would shake out with the investors who put the money up and maybe even the capital structure in there. Are these like a 50-50 kind of a capital? Are they leveraged up to 75% of the value from uh, Mag Capital's perspective? Because how much of that leverage is in each deal is going to equate to a higher or lower risk for the passive investor who might be listening. Um, But I, I, yeah, my mind's wondering how these deals shake out, right? Because one of the things I'm assuming, and maybe I'm wrong, is... Well, it's a triple net lease. And so when I do all the math, it's a very, very safe type of investment to have my money because of the long term nature of the tenant. I mean, am I only looking at seven or eight percent as a passive investor? Or is this going to be more of a a 10 percent plus kind of a deal for someone putting their their cash into a deal like this? All good questions. I can try to unpack this as I can remember them all, but I was uh, (laughs) pulling up a deal um, and you know, I won't go into the, the name of the, the tenant. There's one that we're in contract for right now, right? And I'll use this as an example. Um, I had some materials ready, but a uh, single tenant property company that manufactures basically uh, highly engineered components for the battery industry. That's, um, I'll leave it at that uh, since they're, you know, it's a little sensitive still until the transaction gets done. Um, but the the properties in Tennessee, um, and we're per, we're doing a sale lease back. A twenty year triple net lease will be signed at close of the property. We're purchasing it for thirteen and a half million dollars. Year one rent is nine hundred twenty four thousand. So that comes out to, um, I think, about a six point eight five percent cap rate. Um, and again, you know, I'm taking the rents and I'm going. And you're going. Wait, hold on. What about your expenses? Remember, there's no expenses here. So that year one rent is my net operating income, right? So that's about a $5 per foot um, uh, annual per square foot rent rate. Um, it's, you know, very right down the middle as far as um, what we're seeing for a lot of these types of properties. Um, and especially in an area that's not a primary market, it's a little bit more of a secondary market just outside of Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, and in this case, yeah, it's about 183,000 uh, square feet. Um, trying to think of what else I can give you here. But, you know, this, as far as a return structure, you know, for our investors, I mean, we're oftentimes um, pretty close to the same as far as cash flow goes. And, uh, you know, the attraction to what we do is that we don't have a value add um, strategy here, right? I have a tenant in place. They're paying rent from day one. That means I'm cash flowing from day one. There's nothing I need to do. I don't need to start renovating units and get this place stabilized. It is stabilized. So generally, we'll see anywhere from, you know, 8 to 10% in cash flow starting from day one, which is great. And then on the backside, if we hold the property for, you know, five years, let's just say on average, um, at the end of that, you know, you paid down debt, you've increased the net operating income. And usually it takes work to do that. We have this built into that lease, right? There's two, two and a half percent rent increases annually. So over that time, you've increased the rent and there is some front end value that's created too. And this part is, uh, I know it's a little bit less tangible, but I always kind of tell people, I go, look, you have this property, sure it's for sale, but we're creating a lot of contractual value through this institutional grade lease. It's a 20 year triple net lease. We build in institutional features like quarterly financial reporting from the tenant. It's a way we mitigate risk, right? We follow how they're performing and doing uh, strong force majeure clauses. And we've really studied the publicly traded REITs and we see how they structure their leases. We realize what they look for in an institutional grade lease. So we've really learned how to mimic that, um, learn from the greats, right? And create a lease that has that kind of strength to it because that's also what that publicly traded REIT is gonna look for when we sell as they may be the buyer. So if I sell in five years from now, I have 15 years left on this lease. It's a pretty, pretty damn stable property still. So you have a very nice run rate as a buyer. If you're a publicly traded REIT going, hey, I have this triple net portfolio. I'd love to roll this into. Makes sense for us. And here we have a property with an institutional grade lease. This is exactly what we want you know, as a REIT. And for Mad Capital as a seller, uh, it's a nice, easy transaction. So that's um, really some value creation. I'm not going to say it's uh, 50, 100 basis points and cap right there, but a little bit of value is created and just pulling all these pieces together, execute that lease. And now you have this stabilized property. 
Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. All the pieces are there when you have the lead and then you guys are just negotiating all of them and assembling them. What's the debt structure on this one? 13.5 mil is the price, purchase price and you guys borrow? 75%. So in that case, it's about uh, 10 million um, is, is finance. Um, and so, you know, it could be anywhere from 70 to 75%. That's typical. Sometimes we get as low as 65 um, sometimes the CMBS products out there are a little bit lower leverage, but longer amortization, you know, 30 year amortization there. But oftentimes we're finding that 70 to 75 percent, 25 year amortization, usually a, a fixed rate over 10 years. And, you know, this is a, a nice stable investment for banks, too. Right. That's why you're going to get that long term. They're going, hey, I'll give you a 10, 15 year term sometimes because I have a 20 year lease here. I really believe in this tenant. You showed me all their financials. You know, this particular one I uh, mentioned in Tennessee the company does about 105 million in revenue, which is OK. Right. I mean, if you look at uh, the public equities market, I mean, this would be considered, uh, you know, a small cap. Right. Um, uh, as far as how large they are. However, they do a 20 percent EBITDA margin. That's a really high margin. Nice. Right. I mean, you, you can find people in manufacturing in the low teens. And even in this sort of uh, mid to high single digits, depending on the industry that they're in, right? Food production, for instance, is a low margin industry, really steady demand, but they ride on thinner margins. So um, you find these different sort of characteristics of different tenants. And it's important for us to know, and that's why we have a really great credit team here, what's sort of normal, what's strong, what's weak. And so we can kind of determine, hey, is this, is this a good tenant? Do we want these people backing this long-term lease? So when I do that, let's just call it a 2% per year increase in rent. Is that what you said roughly? That's conservative? Correct. So is that going to compound each year, Drew? Is it like it's 102% in year two, and then it's like 102.2? or That's going to compound. So 2% okay. increase from the year before. Um, so so our, our, rents, our rents will be, what, 111% of what they are day one, and then when you uh apply the cap rate if we assume the cap rate is still what it is today the 13.5 million purchase turns into what sale price uh on that conservative basis if and if you just had to guess that's fine too we don't need an exact calculation yeah now i'm doing the math though i can't help myself but you know, year <laughs> one rent here because they have the pro forma in front of me but nine hundred and twenty four thousand dollars in year one uh year five it's uh a million dollars uh in 160 a million one hundred and sixty-seven dollars. So you figure you got about seventy-six thousand dollars in increase, a little bit more than that. Uh, let's see. You know, that's about uh, eight and a half percent or so increase in in rents over that time. So yeah, it's not a value add deal, but you are creating some value over that course of that time. So it's certainly you know we're not getting. I mean, I've seen multifamily deals where people are projecting, hey, we're going to have four or five percent rent increases annually, which is pretty wild considering where some markets are. I would say, hey, if you're an investor, take a step back, think about how realistic you might think that is. And maybe it is, you know, uh, but really step back and just look at that and, and think about where that means rents are going and why they're going to justify that. So in our case, you know, we have very nice steady increases, but we're not going to double rents over the course of five years. You know, that's not the goal. Um, the goal here is to have a very steady yielding cash flow. And it's been really attractive for people recently because they are looking around at housing prices and how wild it is and saying, Hey, I used to really believe in, in uh, buying this house and holding it and renting it for a few years and seeing that appreciation. And now it's getting a little bit uh, harder for me to wrap my head around that. It feels riskier because I see price pricing and housing going up 25% over the last 12 months or whatever it is. It's something like that. But uh, I don't feel as comfortable buying a house and, and planning on the same appreciation because I feel like things could flatten out a little bit or even go down, right? It's always possible. So people are starting to look around for a yield and I'm finding a lot of our investors saying, hey, uh, they're doubling down with us because they're going, I'm looking for more yield, for more cash flow because what I'm seeing in the housing market is uh, scaring me a little bit. And I, I don't want to tell people, you know, your listeners that, that I believe it's a bad investment. Absolutely not. It's just there are a little bit more risks in certain markets, um, you know, at, at market prices. Um, it is a little difficult to to imagine pricing going up at the same rate that it has over the last five years. 
Makes sense. So if we apply that new cash flow at the uh, 6.85 cap, what do you think the resale or even the resale that you used in the pro forma if you guys, so I'm, I'm making the assumption too, just based on what you said, Drew, that you guys are probably building on a five or seven year timeline and then actually planning to exit these and then return capitals to investors. Correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm right, what would be the Absolutely. pro forma? sale price yeah yeah we have a preferred return that a hurdle that we meet with our investors we actually increase that over time since the rents are going up uh, and then when we sell we have an 80 20 split with our investors in favor of the investors of course um, and you know a lot of our deals were somewhere between 16 and 20 percent average annual return is where we're targeting um, and we've we've gone full cycle in about 20 deals so it's always helpful you know if you're talking to a sponsor have you done this before you know you're projecting this but have you hit your targets before and you know we've missed on a couple of targets not by a lot but we've missed on a couple and we've it wildly exceeded some and a lot of we just nailed right on target so you have that um that uh, spread of course and real estate deals you just uh you know it's i don't know anyone who's just nailed exactly what they thought they would hit uh on every single deal it's just yeah right depend yeah bernie, Ma bernie madoff <laughs> <laughs> right exactly so yeah. so far so far um we've we've done pretty well just by being conservative on that exit cap rate and i mean i'll again i kind of talking about this tennessee example uh, some of these we we get a uh, an opportunity because that seller needs to execute, right? They're not widely marketing it going, we're going to go to the highest bidder. They want to know that someone can, it's a financing transaction. Remember that. So they're going, I need the funds uh, in four or five months from now. Uh, maybe they don't need it, but they're going, I have initiatives that I'm trying to execute on, right? I have, uh, you know, new things I need to invest in. I need to have capital or needs for this capital. So I can't dilly dally with the highest bidder and have someone go, oh, our financing fell through. Okay, back to the drawing board, try to find a new buyer. So they really want to find someone who has experience doing this. And so we get a little bit of a price break there. I mean, honestly, this property that we're getting at about a 6.85% cap rate, I really think this would trade for a kind of six and a quarter percent cap rate if we're just widely marketed, um, especially after executing on a lease like this. So there is some uh, value that we're able to, I don't want to say create, but kind of um, uh, in, inherit just through this transaction from a seller who really wants to get the transaction done at a fair price, uh, but not doesn't necessarily have to have top dollar. Got it. So the sale price on the pro forma for this deal is? I uh, don't have that in front of me, but um, I think we were Again, we're uh, being a little conservative and a six and a half percent cap rate, I mean, really is is conservative, especially I think, again, this thing could be close to a six percent cap rate today, um, but you don't know where you're going to be in five years. So for us, you know, we're always looking at the interest rates. I think that's the biggest risk to a lot of the commercial real estate investment world is, hey, where are things going to be in five years, right? If I plan to exit then, you know, if there's a spike, though, that's... Um, you know, a great place for us to be in though, is if there is a spike and, and interest rates may go up, but sometimes you see over time, they will have a, a sudden spike and they usually settle back down. If that happens, we're not going to sell at that time. It's a horrible time to sell, right? All the buyers are going to pull back. Sales prices are going to go down. Um, but usually you see that even out. And so we're in a great place because in year five, I'll have 15 years left on that lease. I'm not going to sell them. I'm going to continue to hold and cash flow. I have a lot of security around that lease uh, term that's in front of me being at 15 years. And we don't see the value of that asset start to erode until you get below about eight to 10 years left on that lease. That's when you see the value come down because a buyer is going to say, hey, there's, I'm taking on a little more risk, right? In eight years, I might have a vacant building for all I know. So yeah. it starts slowly to sort of erode away. And so for us, we're always looking to sell, you know, before that eight to 10 year uh, lease term left, you know, that's you're in a pretty good place as long as you're above that when you exit and someone else feels good about taking on, you know, 10, 10 plus years of lease term left and they go, hey, this is great. I'm going to cash flow for 15 years. So it's a nice gotcha. place for them. And, and uh, I hope that makes sense. It seems like you don't want to answer the question directly. Is it like a legal thing? A disclosure thing? Don't want it on a recording? Uh, the exit uh, cap rate or what the, we're the exit the sale price. Yeah, it was a 13. I don't have it in front of me. I think it's a six and a half percent cap rate. Okay. So we got this at 6.85. So and we would have to we would so, have to do some math on that and it would be like yes i i don't know sorry i'm not avoiding gotcha. the i didn't I, did, I thought it was just here. on the pro forma there not to be difficult it's just that uh, i'm looking at um 
the debt pro forma that I was just working with on a bank. So I'm yeah. still lining up debt on this thing and and we don't yeah, put not, our not trying to be a, not trying to be a dick. I'm just penciling no, the no, no. <laughs> Uh, I came up with like 15.384 million. Does that sound like roughly what would be expected? Probably a $2 million gain in a five year period, maybe. Say that again. Sorry. I came up with 15.384 million at a 6.5 cap. That sounds about right. It's probably a little higher because I think I used a million flat for the cash flow when we did the compounding by 2%. So I think you actually have a little higher higher cash flow there. I didn't know if it was like a, you know, a filing thing and we weren't allowed to pin a number on there, that's all. Right. No, you uh I mean, you could take that rent for instance at about a million bucks and divide it by six and a half cap. Is that what you just did? That's what I did, yeah. Right, exactly. So that's uh, I found I pulled up our our full pro forma, and yeah, we're assuming at a six and a half percent exit cap rate. And again, we're not looking at uh, you know we're buying at a six point eight five. We're not assuming that the market is going to compress. Uh, we're looking at as we got a better deal than what you would see openly and widely marketed today. Um, certainly, much better, you know. And I think it would go for less than a six and a half percent cap rate you know, a higher price if it were widely marketed today, but we're being a little conservative there. So um, important to kind of note that because sometimes people go, oh, you're assuming that the market's just going to keep getting higher and higher in pricing uh, on the cap rate. And the answer is no, right? We're actually looking at it being a little bit softened up from where it is today. We just got a great uh, price on this by by coming in and executing on a sale lease back. Yeah, and I guess there's not this uh, wild competition out there, maybe for the sale lease back kind of deals, right? It's the first time I've ever had this conversation on my show in the last six or seven years, I think that I've been doing it. So you kind of have this unique niche that you're able to get in there and negotiate at what is potentially a stronger deal. And then I mean, with the yeah. institutional buyer in mind already, when you're doing the paperwork on the front end, it, it feels like a logical step. And to me, I'm buying multifamily and I see what's out there in the marketplace and what is closing. Uh, and the 6.85 cap rate sounds like kind of a little high, actually. Right. You know, I might think, it, I might have thought it would have been in the fives. And I'm sure if we were in a, uh, you know, one of the major cities, we probably are in the fives for a product like this versus a secondary market. So yeah, I, I think the cap rates sound reasonable, but you and I would be both looking into a very foggy crystal ball if we thought we were going to be able to pin that for sure 100% five years from now. So that cap rate really depends around, again, where's the risk in this type of investment? It's around the tenant um, and their credit profile. So uh, if I have this exact same building in Tennessee that I'm talking about now with the exact same lease, except signing at the bottom of that lease is Amazon instead of this company, right? Uh, again, this company is very profitable. They do you know $20 million in profit every year. If you, you know, there's still a chance that they can go out insolvent, right? There's absolutely more credit risk around them than Amazon, which is not going anywhere, right? So if Amazon signs at least, what cap rate does this trade at today? It's going to be more like a four and a half, four, maybe even closer to three and a half. Wow. Three percent cap rate. It's going to be a very low yielding investment that's going to attract institutional dollars who basically want to place and park their dollars, right? They're going to say, hey, we're getting, you know, three and a half, four percent yield here. We're able to keep up with inflation with the real estate benefits that we have here. And I have a sure thing for the next 20 years of Amazon, right? Amazon's never going to break that lease. So, and if they do this recourse, obviously, they're always going to be solvents. At least uh, that's what I would say over the next 10 years uh, minimum. So, uh, that, that's really where these cap rates uh, hinge on is the credit risk around uh, the tenants. So for instance, if it was a startup company, hey, you know what, we've been in business for a year or two. Um, we want to you know, sign a new lease on this thing. They don't really have a credit background. So it doesn't mean that we're actually going to be scared away. We'll look for things like a personal guarantee from the founder. You know, you oftentimes you find a serial entrepreneur who they go, this is my 10th company I've started. I have a wild, successful track record behind me. Well, that's worth something, except this entity has no assets, no balance sheet. Uh, I don't feel really great about them signing this lease because if they go under, I, I'm just, you know, stuck holding this property here that's vacant and I really have to work to get a new tenant in. And if I've done my job right, I can do that, but it still can take three to six months, right? So in that case, we might say, okay, this 
a personal guarantee from the founder who's worth 50, 100, 150 million dollars maybe, this individual is going to give us a personal guarantee. Okay, I can work around this. And now I may also have a opportunity to get a property at something like a 10, 11, 12% cap rate. I mean, that's what you will see in that world with this sort of startup tenant because they're going to know that it's going to, uh, they're going to have to pay a premium rent or they're going to have to give a hell of a discount on the, the purchase price with that type of tenant in there. So there are opportunities to be had there, but that's not where we like to play. Again, unless the weird example where someone's going to sign on the dotted line with a lot of personal net worth. Uh, otherwise, you know, no thanks. We want a really nice uh, solid credit tenant, um, but a private credit tenant. So I want that middle market because I can't find the yield with an Amazon or a Walmart or a Home Depot. Um, you can, again, find an investment there. You're not going to see the yield that most investors are looking for. Gotcha. Uh, a couple are, but getting back to what you said, though, on there must not be a lot of competition there. It's not coming from individuals, right? We're in a sort of an institutional sandbox that we play in. This is a really sophisticated transaction. Again, we've hired, uh, we have three guys on our credit team that all came from publicly traded REITs. Uh, why do you think that is? It's because we compete with publicly traded REITs day in and day out for these properties. You know, I just talked to a broker yesterday and he goes, yeah, we got two, three offers already in. And I'm like, let me guess. And I named off four or five big reads, you know, Store Capital, uh, Angelo Gordon, Verit's, uh, Stag Industrial. And he goes, yep, you just named off all of them. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> yep, we, we see these guys day in and day out because this is the world that they operate in. And what's cool for us and our investors is we're able to take this institutional investment and really bring it directly to private investors because the only way to get exposure to a lot of these types of transactions and that type of investment, I should say, is through a publicly traded REIT, right? If I go buy publicly traded shares of store capital, I'm going to yield like four and a half percent. That's pretty standard for, and that's actually pretty good for a, a REIT, right? So four and a half percent and okay, fine. You know, it's going to be really diversified. They're going to manage it really well. And they're actually a really great company, but being in that sort of uh, structure and, and all of um, the inefficiencies around a REIT, you're not going to get the kind of yield that you can with a direct investment. Gotcha. So if, if anyone's listening right now, Drew, there's probably, I'm guessing, two ways they might want to reach out and do business. Number one, probably passive capital investing, you know, the way you described it early in the episode. Uh, and would someone want to reach out if they stumbled upon a deal like this and somebody was looking for a uh, triple net leaseback situation? A hundred percent. Yeah. We're always looking at new opportunities. So, um, you know, if someone goes, Hey, I, I, you know, I know a guy will make a connection with you and, and maybe we can work out some kind of brokerage situation. We're always looking at new opportunities, sale leasebacks. That's what uh, I'm constantly looking at and our whole team is. Um, but yeah, if someone wants to reach out and say, Hey, I want to participate or get some exposure here um, and just kind of see how we can partner up in a passive sort of way, uh, they can reach out to me in my email, drew at magcp.com that's magcp.com or they can go to the website magcp.com cool i have two final questions here as we wrap up do you have a book recommendation or two it could be commercial real estate or otherwise that was impactful for you and your your career drew um i'll just give you what i'm currently reading i'm a i'm a big podcast and audiobook guy and i'm going through uh an audiobook right now sam zell kind of notable billionaire real estate investor um he has a book called um, Am I Being Too Subtle? And it's all about him sort of zigging when other people zag and really finding, uh, being kind of a contrarian and looking into areas where people seem to be running away from and kind of asking questions and finding opportunities as people tend to kind of run like a crowd uh, towards certain things and away from <laughs> other things. So he's, I mean, it's a, it's a great, um, you know, just a personality and a trait to kind of pick up some on and and think hey don't don't just follow the crowd look over here it doesn't mean it's a you know a good place to be but ask some questions dig around because there might be some some gems there and uh that's a little bit of what we do sometimes um as a firm you know we kind of go okay why why is this um uh, why why is this seller having a hard time here what's going on okay there's some uh hair around the environmental issues okay can we work around that and you find these great opportunities. I mean, as all your listeners who are real estate investors, 
you know, keep that in mind and or read that book and just kind of think about that when something looks like a too hairy, just see, uh, ask some more questions and, and try to get creative because that's ultimately where the best investments come from. Yeah, we make money solving problems. So the last is the, the gem, the crown jewel of wisdom, if you will. Uh, if you could go back and tell yourself right there where you were deciding whether or not to be active or passive, right? So early in your career, you know, everything you know now, is there anything that you would go back and share with your younger self? I just would have bought Bitcoin instead, you know, that's <laughs> <laughs> not the first time that's been the answer. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, whatever it might be, Google stock, anything, uh, hindsight's 2020, or I would have known who to bet uh, on the 2015 Super Bowl, you know, all that. So, uh, no, going back then, I think I would have told myself to really, um, you've made your decision, Drew, you've gone passive, that's fine. And really, in hindsight, I believe that was the right decision for me, wouldn't have changed anything about that. But I would have said, hold on review more deals, look at, you know, look at least a dozen deal and ask questions on every single one of those before you write a check. And I was just so excited to jump in um, that I jumped in on pretty much the first one that I looked into deeply. And, uh, you know, so be it a little learning lesson. Again, I haven't lost money from it, but I certainly could have done better by just slowing down for a minute. And I, I really believe in leaning into every kind of situation in life and biting, but you can lean a little too hard sometimes it, you got to find that balance. So, um, you know, it's, it never feels like maybe the right time to write a check for any type of investment and you can't tie yourself up and just worries, but um, you should just like anything, look at a few different things and not jump on the first uh, opportunity that's placed in front of you. Nice. Good stuff. Uh, Drew, I, I had a blast. Great conversation here. Thank you for uh, giving us this hour here. Appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, it's great, Dan. Thanks for having me.